seated for a minute, and just a minute, and then I, I had me read this story last night, and it was so good, I thought I would share it with y'all. Oh, go ahead. Who built you out? tried them. He said, too loose. The man said, I have another pair. Try these. The, man, the speaker tried them on and responded, too tight. The man was not taken back at all. He said, I have one more pair. Try them. The speaker said, they fit perfectly with that. He ate his meal and he gave his speech and after dinner meeting was over, the speaker went to thank the man for his help. He said, I want to thank you for coming to my aid and where's your office I've been looking for a good dentist. The man replied, I'm not a dentist, I'm an undertaker. <laughs> but my father-in-law, years ago, he had all his teeth pulled. He was trying to find a good place to get a good set. And he went to the, he went to the funeral home and got his teeth. He said there was only two drawbacks. And one, I had to go through my, a bunch of pairs to find one that fit. But they're only $25. <laughs> he said, but the bad thing was, he said he found out there was a set of women's teeth and they about talked him to death for he could get them back to the funeral home. <laughs> True story. True story. <laughs> Ask DC. He heard his, he heard his good daddy tell it. Good. Give them a hand clap. That's good to hear stuff about that. We're still going on the armor. We are honestly almost through. Now, I was supposed to be gone this week, but they got us in a queue. Everybody know what the queue is? They got us in a queue. And since I'm going with the sheriff's office, I've got to wait for the queue. And so, you just might not see me here, or you might see me here, I don't know. And I uh, may go more than one time. It all depends on how I go and where I go to. But they told me where I'm going to be going. I'll probably get hit in five counties a day. So uh, be praying for that. And there's other people that uh, may be going. And, and so please pray for them too because this is not an easy task. And you, you better know that God's got you because, it's, you know, it, you're not going to, you know, to... to uh, Skittles and lollipops. You know, you're going into broken lives that are torn, and some will never, ever, no matter what, will ever be the same. And so we got to be praying for them all the time. So we're talking about the armor of God, and and I'm almost through. We got two more sermons. I thought this was going to be the last, but as usual, when I get going, it just seems to just flow, and so I had to let it flow. 
But today, I want you to really listen hard. I hope you listen every Sunday, but especially this Sunday. Please don't let anything distract you. If you got anything at all that's going to distract you, please push it to the side. Because this is probably, all the armor is important. Every bit of it is important. That's why it says take on the whole armor of God. But this, this piece right here is very important. Because this is a piece that actually can, can take, uh, there you go. This piece right here can actually penetrate the armor. Yeah, I'll tell you how it penetrates the armor. Okay, now, now I'm going to get to it. So that's not penetrating. Well, I'm just telling you is it gets past the armor. And so this is so important. You better have it. And, and I've seen it in action so many times recently that it just boggles my mind. And so, so here we go. Let's, let's get our Bibles out. Stand for the reading of the word. Ephesians chapter 6, verse 10. How many on a regular basis invites people to come with you? Church can't grow. Look, we can put a free fish. Look, when you go fishing, you can put a free fishing sign in your boat. You'll never catch a fish. You got to cast out. The way we build our church is you invite people to come. Okay? If everybody wins one, the church doubles every Sunday. Everybody wins one, the church doubles. So it's very important. And, and you got to, it's so important that you invite others to come to church, especially in this day and time with what's going on around us. Ephesians chapter 6, verse 10. Finally, my brother, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For the wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. Wherefore, take unto you the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day. And having done all to stand, stand. Stand therefore, having your loins girt about with truth, having on the breastplate of righteousness, your feet shod with the gospel, or the preparation of the gospel of peace. Above all, take in the shield of faith, wherewith you shall be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked, and take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God. Praying always with prayer, all prayer, and supplication in the Spirit, watching thereunto with all, persever all perseverance and supplication. For all saints, stretch out your hands this way. Father, we love you. We praise your name. We thank you for your grace. We thank you for your mercy. Help us, God, to know that you got this and help us, God, today above all days, Lord, to keep our mind on this message. To keep our ears peeled, our hearts open, our eyes alert, because this is by far going to be one of the most powerful of all the armors, sermons. I ask you right now to bless us, Lord, to help us, God, to see, to know, to understand, and to know that the end is near, and we are a mighty army, and we need to get our marching orders and take care of business. And that's what we're doing right now. In the name of Jesus, we pray. And the church said, Amen. Amen. So here we go. You be seated. On the way down, tell somebody the past is behind us. The future is ahead of us. God is with us. And nothing, and nothing shall be impossible. All right, here we go. <clears throat> then armor up. And I, I'll just wait till we get going before I tell you what this is. If you've been following, you know what this is coming up. But just a few. You're going to get through what you're going through. No matter how bad it is, I got a call last night or a text last night. Somebody, their child has been fighting cancer and they just texted me and said, the doctor told me that my child won't make it past December. It was a shock to my system. I know it had to be a shock to theirs. They just, oh. 
There's so many things happening around us, going through the detention centers everywhere, and the things that you see. And they know, we try to say, well, they're just, these guys are just locked up and they're, they're being held captive, and, and so they're having a jailhouse religion. There is some guys with jailhouse religion. That, my friends, is not jailhouse religion. Amen. Amen? That's evangelism. All the man had was a milk cart. But look at what he done. That's evangelism. If a man in prison has got nothing, can evangelize, we can too. Amen. Amen. If he can make a difference for God, we can. <clears throat> we can too. So, so here we go. Remember this. Be strong in the Lord and the power of his might. Amen. <clears throat> I can't say this enough because I can't fathom how people get this all mixed up. Christ said he would build his church and the devil knows that he cannot stop the building of the church. Upon this rock I'll build my church against the hell shall not prevail but he's going to try to stop the movement of the church and that's us. Christ is building us but so many times Satan is stopping us. Wow. What he whispers in our ear, what he says to us, what he does around us, although we've got it all in here, it never comes out. Because although God is doing the building, Satan's got us at bay. So now, let's go ahead just real quick. For weapons of warfare not carnal, but mighty through God for the pulling down of strongholds, we've got to realize that we are equipped for the battle. And we also have to know that. When Paul said put on the whole armor of God, he was not making the suggestion. He wasn't saying cherry pick. He was making a command. Make sure you put on the whole armor of God because the battle's coming. Some of y'all already been through so much battle. You know, we look good. Most of us in here look good. You understand? Most of us look good. But the truth be known, and we can see each other as Satan sees, as God sees, that we've been fighting battles all week. Some of us would actually be limping in here. Some of us have bandages on our heads. Some of us have bandages on our arms. We would have blood stains all over us because spiritually we've been fighting battles. But we don't see that because it's a spiritual thing. So we have to put on the whole armor of God. And so. <clears throat> Here's what we did. We started talking about this radical protection. There's three classes and categories of armor. And the first time we talked about the first category, of course, was the armor of consistency, the loins girded about with truth, the breastplate of righteousness, your feet shod with the gospel of peace. The next is uh, the armor of confidence, the shield of faith. Come back here. The shield of faith and the helmet. Salvation. This was so powerful. I left it up here. There's three things Satan might be whispering in your ear, even as you're in here, even as you were praising and worshiping God, even as you hear the message right now. There's three things could be in your ear. Number one, you question God's truth. Did God really say that? Number two, you deny God's truth. No, God didn't really say that. Number three, you may change God's truth. Or he, Satan, to you. No, this is what God actually said, what he actually meant. You may be hearing Satan speak those lies in your head right now. <clears throat> the helmet is a metaphor for pretending our minds. It warns us to guard our thoughts. And the devil can tamper with our thoughts. He can meddle. If he can do that, he can meddle in our lives. If he can meddle in our lives, man, oh man, are things going to be bad? We look at Genesis chapter 3, and I'm not going there right now. Let's keep on going. So get ready. Here it goes. Get ready. This may be a little graphic. One of the roughest, we thought that the Civil War was bad. 40 and 50,000 died at one time. What about when the Romans came to conquer? Oh, there was something called release hell and they would shoot fireballs and 
they would have the cavalry and the cavalry and all that. But most of it was gruesome, hand-to-hand -hand combat. Guys would lose their heads. They would lose body parts. They would be cut in half. Their insides would be laid on the ground. All from hand to hand combat. The most gruesome of that. You see, you never could underestimate the Roman army. The Roman army were gruesome. They were trained killers and the meaner and the more gruesome they got, the better they liked it. They were the ones that the Jews used to crucify Jesus because the Jews couldn't even come close to what the Romans could do to Jesus. In hand to hand combat, that's when the armor would really come into play. Without an armor, you did not stand a chance. God has given us the sword of the Spirit. This is the most aggressive, most effective weapon that God has given us. Ephesians 6 and 17 says, take the whole armor of, or take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. I want to break this down a little bit. The Romans had a big arsenal. As a matter of fact, they had five different swords in their arsenal. I'm going to tell you about these swords and then I'm going to tell you about the sword of the spirit. Because of these swords and because of the terror these guys would put on people, just like terrorism today, they many times defeated whole cities just by their reputation, by the terror that they brought, by the way they marched, by the way they stood together, by the way they conducted their self, many times all they had to do was march in the city and people would lay down for the Roman army. Scared to death. Uh, the five swords that the Roman armies had, let's talk about it. The very first sword, of course, is called, I love this, warriors are always the fastest or the strongest men Strength and speed can be developed through uh, training. Warriors are those who choose to stand between their enemy and all that he loves and holds sacred. Wow. The very first sword that he would use is the, the gladius sword. The gladius sword, it was, uh, it was extremely heavy. It was those great old big swords. It was very long. It was cumbersome. It actually was awkward. It had to be handled with both hands and it was only sharpened on one side. The other side of the sword was blunt and dull. So with swing with both hands, they could take off a man's head or they could actually go down on his armor, whichever way what he needed. But because it was so cumbersome, that when you were in true hand-to-hand -hand combat and the enemies engaged you with everything they've got, you didn't want that gladius sword. A gladius or gladius, however you want to say it, sword, actually became something you didn't want to have as you're fighting because you needed to move, move quickly. There was the next four swords. This is going to be the last sword we're going to talk about, but I'll put it up there anyway. The second sword, it was shorter, it was narrower, it was lighter, it was 17 inches long, about two and a half, three inches wide. And this sword was used again 
Now we're starting to get into hand-to-hand -hand combat. The third sword was even shorter than the second sword. It looked like a dagger. And it was carried in a small hidden scabbard inside of their cape. And when they were when they finally got their when they finally got their opponent down, if he was not wearing a breastplate, he could actually stab him in the heart. If he was wearing a breastplate, he could stab him in the throat and take him out. Remember, they were gruesome. The fourth sword was very long and slender. It was used by the cat the cavalry, and uh, this actually looked more like a fencing sword. Because the cavalry, when they're riding their horses, they got to be careful what they're swinging. And so because it was so small, it was very seldom used in battle. Here's the number one thing they used. And it's amazing that God uses it to describe his words. The fifth sword. I love that. The word of God is sharper than any two-edged sword. See, you see that sword with the cross in it? See, Paul had this in mind when he wrote Ephesians chapter 6, 17, and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God. Get it? Now watch. The word sword here is in the Greek, machara, which is where we get machete. Machara, machete. This was probably the most brutal of weapons that the Romans had when they were in hand-to-hand -hand combat. It was about 19 inches long. Both sides of the blade were razor sharp, and it was double more powerful and deadlier than any sword that they had. And here's why. This is what I was telling you. It had that, the end pointed up. And when they were in hand-to-hand -hand combat, they would take that sword and they would find the breastplate. And it was, the, 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 the machio was pointing up and they would take it and go up under the breastplate and they would twist it. And when they twisted it, whatever it hit was destroyed. Your heart, your stomach, the entrails, whatever. That's why this was so deadly. They would take it, stick it up under a breastplate, and they would twist it and twist it again. And when the person fell down, they fell down dead. This is the one, because it was the most dangerous of all, this is the one that I said could actually, maybe I overstated, penetrate the armor. It's the one that can get beyond the armor. Now, what's that got to do with the Word of God? Let, let, let's break all this down. When you look, start looking at all this, you're going to find out something. Let me watch this. Anybody ever heard of Rima? Rima Word? Where God is speaking to you? He's taking His written Word and He's speaking His written Word to you. Somebody else is speaking His written Word to you. Okay? So, so here we go. I love this. There's a battle going on. Keep your eyes open and your sword sharp. <coughs> so what is Rima? The word uh, machia, machria, describes the sword of the spirit, which declares that God has given the church a weapon that is brutal against our enemy. This is a brutal weapon we can use against our enemy and take him down. This is what Jesus used in the wilderness. So watch. Our weapon, the sword of spirit, has potential to rip our foe to shreds. Not people, our foe, Satan. The sword of the spirit says, which is the word of God. And that word, word, is the Greek, rima. Which describes, look at this, something that is spoken clearly, vividly, in undeniable language, spoken in unmistakable, unquestionable, certain and definite terms. Think about Jesus in the wilderness. He had God's word already in him. And when the enemy was trying to come at him, in the last, especially that last time, the last three great temptations, he used the word of God. He spoke back the word of God 
to the enemy, and the, and the Bible says that the enemy had to leave him for a season. When Elijah was needed to talk to God, and he was so depressed, God spoke to him in a still, small voice. Rama, 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 how are you going to say it? Rama. Paul rode to Damascus when he was knocked off his horse, and God spoke to him. It was Rama. Paul on the rooftop when he got that vision, it was Rama. And one of the greatest displays of Rama in the Word of God is on the day of Pentecost. When every man there, although the apostles were speaking one language, every man there heard in their own language. Wow. What kind of power can we possess if we do that? I, I remember one day I had this great desire. I, I, I couldn't even explain it. I had this great desire to get to the detention center. So I get to the detention center. I, I told them I got to go. I got to the detention center, walked in, and I, and I didn't know who to ask for. And I said, has is anybody ever had, had any problems, anything going on? And they said, well, this, this person right here, and I said, so let me go see him. I go and see him, and I try to get him out where I can talk to him. I go back and say, can I get him out where I can talk to him? He was already in, in so to speak, the maximum security part. And, I, and he said, no, he, he's a risk for you, so we can't let him out. So I went back, and he there was only two cells, and the guys were actually, one was actually threatening to hurt and or kill the other. It was just bad. It was bad. It was bad. And I sat down and I told the guy, I said, I can't get you out, but I can't sit and talk to y'all. And as I began to talk, I watched God break down walls. And the guy said, has God ever come to you in the middle of your problems and talk to you? I said, sure. I said, matter of fact, God's doing it right now. Not through me. I'm not God. Through me because I got the strangest urge to get up and come. I come in here in the worst of problems. And I'm talking to you. And it was so amazing because there was just tears after tears after tears after tears. And when I left, both of those guys prayed prayers of rededication to Christ. That was Ramah. God told me to get up. And when I got there, I didn't know what I was even going for. When I got there, I knew. Once I got back there, I knew exactly what was going on. And I watched God do a very powerful work that day with guys who wanted to kill each other. And now God had them in control. <coughs> I love this. So a word goes out from my mouth, it will not return unto me empty, it will accomplish that which I desire and achieve the purpose for which I sent it. Isaiah 55 and 11. Wow. Rhema. Word of Scripture, a word from the Lord that the Holy Spirit supernaturally drops into a believer's mind, causing it to supernaturally come alive and impart special power or direction to the believer. I've told this story many times, but it's perfect for right now. I had to get in between two overseers that were having a scuffle. And I actually wound up being the pawn in the middle of it. <coughs> one was trying to help me, the other one's because he saw him trying to help me, and he tried to hurt me, and there was so much going on. And I almost quit the ministry because of it. I remember laying in the car one day, and, and uh, DC's mom was driving, and she said, you just need to pray about it. And I was over here crying. I said, I cannot believe this person over here is hurting me. I've all those ever helped him and this other here. I can't believe two adults are acting that way. I cannot believe the whole thing. I think I'm just going to leave it alone. He said, you better talk to God. <clears throat> and so I remember talking with God. And here's what I said. They talk about Raymond. Here's what I said. God, I've never heard about this. Ever in my entire life. I can't believe what's happening. I've worked for you. I've done for you. 
I give to you, I've sacrificed to you. I can't understand why this is happening. And then I said, I know you say you were tempted at all points like as we are. I said, but this time you have no idea how I feel. That's what I told him. You have no idea how I feel. And God used Ramah and spoke one word. I've been sick with this for a month. God spoke one word and I started healing. Immediately. When I told him he had no idea how I felt, this one here, he had no idea. I'm in this by myself. He said, Judas. As I was telling him how I trusted this man, how I loved this man, how I defended this man, how the Lord was there for him, I can't believe he's doing this, and you don't know how I feel, that one word, Judas. Wow. Brandon is powerful. So, let's just look here at a couple of, I'm getting ready to close, I'm not going to keep you long today. Jesus said in John 14, 26, but the comforter, which is the Holy Ghost, who the Father will send in my name, he shall teach you all things and bring all things to your remembrance whatsoever I've said unto you. Now we're going to dig a little bit. Y'all ready to let the plow down? Y'all say it, let the plow down, Pastor. Let down the <laughs> For the word of God is living and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, even piercing to the even to the division of the soul and spirit and the joints of marrow, and is deserted with thoughts and intents of the heart. God's two-edged sword is word. Number one, can go under the breastplate of Satan. You rip it. And when you pull it out, you struck up. Well, he's still going to be living, but you struck a deadly blow to him. He's got to stay away for a while and get himself back together. The two-edged sword, there's two things that come to my mind, and two things studied in the Greek. Number one, the two-edged sword, God's word, How many has ever been hurt or ever done something stupid? Anybody ever done anything stupid? Am I the only one? No, I'm the only one. I got both hands raised. <coughs> Mama trying to tell me, Daddy trying to tell me, somebody trying to tell me. No, I knew better. Man, I knew better. I know none of y'all been there. I know I'm preaching to myself. I just hold a mirror up. People trying to tell me something. I ain't listening. And one word from God. It penetrates and it cuts. And hurts. Hurts. Because it got my attention. It hurts. When he pulled it out, the other side brought healing. That two-edged sword. One side cut, got to me. The other side brought healing. But also that two-edged sword. That word two-edged means two mouths. Wow, two mouths. <laughs> so when God speaks the word, it comes out of his mouth. And when you and it comes to us, but when we speak it, it comes out of our mouth. And it goes to the situation, but it goes back to him. So think about that. We're part of that. When we speak his word, he gives us so much power and so much authority. That's why Satan doesn't want us to learn the word of God. Because it's so, so powerful. I want y'all to think about something here. DC, come over here and get replace something. God has given his word and his power and you can overcome anything. I remember when I was at Procter Gamble 
I had plenty of money. Man, I had money. I had every kind of insurance I needed. I had all kinds of stuff. It was so powerful. And when I went to ministry, I just gave it all up. And I said, God, now what am I going to do now? I'm not making anything like I was making. I mean, sometimes I'm not sure I was even making anything. And I was like, God, I don't understand. I'm doing what you told me to do. And he said, you trust my word, didn't you? It's more rain, I said, yes, sir. He said, then put it before your eyes. So in my refrigerator, I said, I wrote a book there. I've never seen the righteous forsaken, nor his seed begging bread. And everyone went in that refrigerator. I quoted that. I got what I got in the refrigerator. I put it back and I quoted it again. When I found myself in trouble because of things I had on the center of my bed, as soon as I woke up in the morning, I saw God's mercies were fresh and new every morning. I spoke it. And I had God's word all over my house and over every door. And as I walked through the doors, as I walked through them, I quoted them. Every place I went, I quoted those words. And I quoted them and I quoted them and I quoted them. And it's so amazing that the situation itself had changed. But I changed the outward situation by speaking God's word, instead of speaking worry and fear, I spoke God's word and watched things change. The most powerful weapon we've got is the rhema word of God. Let me show you something here. There's another one of those hopefully make you think how many of God's word has eyes? God's word can see what the human eye cannot see. God's word knows what the no human heart can know. Once you receive his word into your heart, the word immediately begins working to renovate those areas in your mind, your will, your emotions, which is what we call the heart. Your mind, will, and emotions is what we call the heart in the Bible. When we start using the word of God and reading it and applying it in our lives and speaking it, it begins to renovate your mind, your will, and emotions especially those that are off base and are wrong. When God and His Word begins to work inside of you, it cuts through the muck and the mire of your mind. How many know we've all got some muck and mire in our mind? Mire, mire, <coughs> in our mind. And it goes straight to the heart of the matter. As you begin to read God's Word, and as you're going through things, it's amazing. Because the more you read God's Word, the more that you let it penetrate you, your mind, your will, your emotions, your heart, when things start happening to you and against you, guess what? <coughs> you will find yourself, instead of speaking fear, and doubt your mind the Bible says he wants to renew your mind daily when your mind is renewed a renewed mind will cooperate with faith and you'll be able to speak the word of God boldly and cast doubt aside Over the years, I've had family members and I've had
had friends. When problems started coming and I started speaking the word of God, there was some would tell me, when are you going to grow up and be realistic? And I said, I really think I am growing up and I am realistic. Because the word of God is stronger than anything you got. And I had somebody really get on me one day. And at the time it made me mad, but now I'm thinking, man, oh man, what kind of impact was I putting in his life? You know what he said? He looked at me and said, the word of God is your crutch, isn't it? Kind of upset me right to start with, so I thought about it. Yep, it's my crutch. The word of God is my airplane, it's my parachute. It's my Land Rover. It's all of that. And I found when the Word of God when comes in your mouth and flows, things change. I can't change what's happening around me by my doubt. I can't change what's happening around me by my power. I can only change things around me by my shout. I've got to speak the word of God. Does it change instantly? No. Does it change like I necessarily want it to? No. But it changes. Why did God let James be killed with a sword and deliver Peter in the prison? That doesn't make sense. You're going to let one die, you're going to let one be delivered. But see, that's, God's got a plan for everybody. That's where you just have to let God still be God. But God, I need you to show me, to help me, to comfort me. And I sure like that rainbow from time to time, because it sure is nice. Today, remember, the most powerful weapon the devil uses. His sword of his spirit is doubt and it's fear. And when you let doubt and fear get in the way, he can put his hand on your breastplate, grab it, and stick his sword of his spirit up inside and twist you. Or you can stand strong in the word of God when God's speaking his rhema to you. And you're speaking rhema to the devil. Put back out the word of God. You catch him and you twist it under his breastplate. You've got the decision to make right now. Are you tired of your breastplate being ripped? Are you tired of your insides being ripped out? And quit letting doubt and fear catch under your breastplate. Instead, let God's word do what God's word can do. Everybody, please stand. Every head bowed, every eye closed. If you're here today and you say, Pastor, I've been ripped, my insides have been ripped out so many times. Fear and doubt has come and although I had my breastplate of righteousness, he still tore me up. Because although I had that armor on, my fear and my doubt gave him his sword power, his dagger to be inside of me and twisted all my heart, my will, my emotions. <coughs> and I'm ready to quit receiving it and start giving it back to him. My challenge is learn that word of God. And when you need whatever you need, God will give it to you. He'll give you the right word at the right time. And you speak it.
and watch what happens. Every head bowed, every eye closed. <coughs> if you're here today, number one, you would say, I am not as close to God as I need to be. I want you to be honest about that. I'm not as close to God as I need to be. I want to change that right now. Nobody looked around, every eye closed, every head bowed. Would you put up that hand and say, I'm not as close as I want to be to God. It took a lot of courage just to put your hand up. God's got you. God's got you. God's got you. One of the greatest players in the entire world is God, I want to get closer to you. The greatest prayer, God is so pleased when he sees that prayer, when he hears it. Maybe you're here today and just you're tired of having your breastplate grabbed and hit with that sort of fear and doubt and rip your heart, your will, your emotions. You're tired of it. Penetrate up under your armor. You're ready for God to do something special with you and you're ready to use that rhema. I'm talking to you right now, would you put that hand up? I'm tired of my heart being ripped. I'm tired of my emotions, my will being ripped. I'm ready for God to do something. Bless them, Lord. Bless them, bless them, bless them. We're going to pray. And I want you to believe that today is a turning point in your life. Remember, the enemy wants to take fear and doubt and penetrate Go up under your breastplate and twist your mind, your will, your emotions. Or you can take God's word and instead do the same thing to the enemy. Like Jesus in the wilderness said the enemy had to leave for a while. I'm pretty sure he limped off too. <coughs> Let's pray together. Father, pray it out loud with me. Father, I love you. I praise your name. I really want to grow closer. I want to be all that you want me to be. Help me right now to take my mind off of fear and doubt and put it squarely on you and your word. Although I can't see it working right now, I know it is. I thank you for healing my body, healing my life, healing my family, and most of all, for helping me to grow closer. I give it to you right now, in the name of Jesus we pray. And the church said, Amen. 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 God is so awesome. We're going to say the Lord's Prayer. And now after we say the Lord's Prayer, Brother Doug, we just miss this in prayer. Ready? Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Father in heaven, Lord, we thank you for this day. We thank you for your word that has gone forth among us. I pray that we would receive it, that we would send it back to you. We would share your word with those that do not know you. That we let our light shine for you. That we would be an example of what you would have us to be. Or give us strength to do what is not easy. Because you did what was not easy for us. I pray that for everyone here and those that are not able to be here, that you would strengthen them and comfort them in every way. That you would bring us back at the next point in time. So we address that whole prayer. Amen.